Hey Grandview, here are your announcements for the week of Sunday, August 20th. Grandview's College Age Canopy returns next Sunday, August 27th. Let us buy your lunch at White Duck Taco right after church. Be sure to grab a schedule of our college age gatherings at the Life at Grandview table and follow us on Instagram at Grandview College Age. Grandview youth are back to their regular gatherings this week. If your student is not yet regularly involved in learning and growing in their faith alongside students their age and under the guidance of other trusted adults, the Grandview youth is a great place to be. You can grab the youth gathering schedule from the Life at Grandview table or talk with Joy for more information. Love JC is on for Saturday, September 23rd from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. This is a day where dozens of area churches are teaming up to love our city well and work on service projects at organizations throughout the area. All of the projects are organized and there are several with opportunities for kids and students as well. If you would like to participate, please be sure to sign up between now and September 10th. As the school year gets ready to launch, we are getting ready for another year of our mentoring program at Southside Elementary. We partner with an organization called Kids Hope USA to mentor students who could use extra support right here at our neighborhood school. This program is an amazing opportunity, and if you are interested in giving one hour to a student each week, contact Katie or myself. There is an application and training process that is required. You can find out more information at our Life at Grandview table. Two for Two kicks off Wednesday, September 13th. Registration is now open in our Church Center app. This is our intergenerational ministry that includes a meal and unique opportunities to learn something new. The best way to understand Two for Two is to experience Two for Two, so we hope that you'll come check it out this semester. We are also preparing to launch our fall focus for our canopies beginning the week of Sunday, September 10th. We are looking for and recruiting both canopy hosts and participants for the 10 weeks of our fall focus this semester. If you are interested, please contact Katie Woodward or myself, and we would love to get you connected. We have a new form called the Life at Grandview form. This is a new tool to help you get connected at Grandview. By filling out this form, you can let us know that you need to update your contact information, that you would like to receive our weekly newsletter, are looking for a canopy, or are interested in volunteering with our local ministry partners. You can access this form by scanning the QR code on your bulletin if you're at the Buffalo campus, or by scanning the QR code at the Life at Grandview table if you're at the City View campus. We'd love to get you better connected soon. As always, you can learn about these things and more at our Life at Grandview table, at both campuses, on your Church Center app, or in the newsletter. Now, you're in the know. That's a lot of announcements. Um, good morning and welcome to the City View campus of Grandview Christian Church. My name is Patrick Proger. I'm the Emanuel resident here in the area of discipleship. And I am eager to invite you into this trustworthy place where we are committed to being a community that meets with God and with one another. And so in that spirit and in that hope, we want to bring our honest and real and present selves into this space. So if any of our resources at our STEM area can help you towards that end, I strongly encourage you to make use of them. And now we will begin our time together by worship. And so I invite you to stand as we sing. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all today. And I invite you to notice the way that you are feeling and thinking about worship. Um, whether you're way up here or way down here or somewhere in between, I invite you to bring that to God because um, each and every disposition is okay. <laughs> um, some of you are standing, and I invite you to, to worship in whatever way is comfortable for you. If you need a simulation area, there's some folks over there already uh, taking advantage of it. Hey, Jackie. Um, <laughs> let's worship together. Chain will break 
the chains And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Oh, every knee will bow before him So open up the gates Make way before the king to uh, dismiss the kiddos, to go with Molly to kids camp, um, and we're going to enter into a time of prayer, so you guys can all sit down for a little bit if you'd like. Good morning. Uh, our son, Zach, shared a song with me this week uh, by a band called Listener, and so I borrowed a line from the song to uh, be the basis of our prayer today. So if you'll pray with me. God, we gather here today as a ragtag bunch. We come in various states of belief and doubt, pain, sorrow, joy, and contentment. We gather here trying to learn more about you and about ourselves, bringing the offering of our hearts that are often shuttered. Lord, we cannot begin to grasp the vastness of your love, beauty, and power. But maybe realizing that we don't know anything is a good place to start. Help us to approach you and each other with hum humility. And when we catch glimpses of the divine in the world and people around us, let us be awestruck. We come wanting to belong to something larger and more beautiful than going it alone. We want to reach out in love and peace 
and we invite your Holy Spirit to lead us and help us to lean on one another and to learn from one another. Let us wash each other with tears of joy and grief that we might become the family that you desire us to be. Let us wash each other with tears of joy and grief and in doing so, knit our hearts together as a people that are connected by your love and by our shared experience. And help us to be vulnerable enough to let our tears be seen. Help us look around us with open, honest eyes. And as we see the injustice and suffering, let us pray for those who are crying and in pain and in the bitterness of loss. Let us pray for those who are crying for hunger. Let us rejoice with those who are crying at the wonder of a newborn baby or of the relief that comes with the passing of a beloved soul that has suffered long enough. Yes, let us pray for all these things, but also help us to act when we can make things right. And let us do this, always keeping you at the center. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to enter back into a time of musical worship. Um, so if you'd like to stand or take whatever posture you would like, we're going to do two more songs.
scripture reading, um, and after that is when we'll do hugs and howdies. <laughs> Our first scripture reading day is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Find it here. Let's see if we got here. 14 through 19. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, hugs and what is it? Howdy. Hugs and howdy.
Luke is making me look silly by telling me to use this microphone. All right, All right everybody. Sorry, Josiah. Uh, our second scripture reading is from James chapter 1. Oh, boy. can't find my glasses. I'm just going to have to take a shot at this. Verses 23 to 27. I can see it. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. Though that for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they looked like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, oh boy, <laughs> uh, persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act. There we go, sorry. That's messed up over there. Um, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hey, you all, it's Nathan again. We're back for one last week of our recenter, the Cappadocians and a new reality series. We've been looking at this family from the fourth century a long time ago and getting help to learn about them from my friend, Alyssa, who's an Emmanuel graduate, a PhD student at Emory. And this is the stuff that she learns and reads and writes and teaches about. And so she's been really helpful to us. Uh, Alyssa, we're here in the last week. We've, we've talked about Basil and about Gregory of Nyssa. And today, we're concluding by looking at their sister, their older sister, Macrina. What do we need to know about the life and legacy of Macrina? So everything we know about Macrina or Macrina, as some people say, is that is all from what her brother Gregory wrote about her. He wrote a life about her called Life of Macrina. And also in one of his uh, treatises, it's like a dialogue with his sister. Um, she was the oldest of all of the siblings and kind of the ultimate big sister. Um, she is also the one who, after their father died, sort of spearheaded the shift of their family estate into this communal monastic style ascetic life. Um, she very much was uh, the reason why her brothers Basil and Gregory joined the ascetic life and she really was kind of that model for them. So it's, it's just really amazing to read the way that they credit her as, as an example, as a teacher, as someone who showed them the way they should go. Alyssa, help us understand just how, is it unique? What's it, what's the, how do we understand Macrina's life kind of in the larger context of the situation of women in the Roman Empire? So within the Roman Empire, as we mentioned before, kind of everything's structured within their, your status. And for women of higher status from wealthier families, such as Macrina, there was a lot of agency and independence that could be had. Within the Roman family, a um, woman was allowed to inherit from her father after her father's death. They were able to have property, write their own wills, things like that, could have influence in economic systems, write contracts, stuff like that. And women were also able to study. We have evidence of women philosophers and all of those things are sort of like women could do these things. So it's not abnormal that Macrina sort of took this leadership role within the family and was able to do all of these different things. Um, it was a very Christian way of living out her role within Roman society and her status within it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really helpful information as we look to her today. We're going to learn just some from her example and the way that her life made space and helped to raise up her brothers in a way that was going to shape the history of the church forever, our lives even. But before we finish, Alyssa, we're in this kind of weird series where we're taking an extra special look at the history of the church. And as 
you're a you're a historian. You you are a Christian. You are someone who is convinced that these things matter. I wonder what word you might kind of leave for us about the importance and value of studying church history, not just to know some facts, but for how it might encourage us, strengthen us today. So one thing that you start to realize when you study church history is that a lot of the tensions and struggles are over how do we live as Christians in the world that we're in when the world is a little bit or a lot of bit chaotic, uh, when times are uncertain, when things are shifting rapidly, and it seems like everything outside of the church is changing constantly. But also we can't just get out of our culture. You could, and that's what the monastic movements were for, but they're really engaging with this question of this is who we are as Christians, and this is who we are as Romans or Greeks or Cappadocians, things like that, and trying to really engage with that tension between using what you learn in school and education and just in the world around you, but also how your faith has anything to bear on that. That's so helpful, Alyssa. That's, I mean, I think that's what we're after. We've called it the Cappadocians and a new reality because of how new the world felt in the fourth century Roman Empire. There was just lots of things were brand new and the church had to figure it out. But in many ways, we're always at a, at a place like that, always trying to figure out what it means to live faithfully. Uh, Alyssa, thank you for helping us to look back, um, to be well informed, to be well situated for these. Thanks for helping us preachers out. Uh, so we didn't get too far out of the uh, comfort zone of kind of what we could do. You, you've been a great help. Thank you so much for being with us this series. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, we're back to finish out the series on the Cappadocians. Uh, my friend Alyssa was really pumped uh, when we first called her. Said, hey, Alyssa, can you help us? Um, and she, she was excited about that, and she was immensely helpful to us and compiled a bunch of notes for us and put things together that just kind of helped to round out and kind of point us in the right directions for stuff to read and, and things to find. Really grateful. It's kind of fun when you get to call your friends and say, hey, do you want to do your job kind of while I'm doing my job? And then we get to work together and have both of our jobs be enriched. It's really fun to get to do with your friends. So I'm, I'm grateful a lot to Alyssa. But... As you've heard, we're finishing the Cappadocians, and uh, we are at the end of our series, but in many ways, as you can maybe already tell, we are approaching the person who helps to have this series have a beginning at all. Uh, Macrina really is at the heart and center of this amazing family that helped the church to identify key commitments in a time of transition and change. You remember the first week we looked uh, at St. Basil, uh, St. Basil the Great, or Basil of Caesarea, he's called, and, and with him we learned to ask, what does loving my neighbor require? And we, we, we heard the way that he preached through um, to help his congregation in a time of famine and discovering ways and to commit to serving the poor and the sick. And then Gregory, last week with him, we learned to ask, what is the meaning to, to, of saying that all people are made in the image of God? And how might we grow together in the likeness of God, to be more like God, even as we seek to honor and, and identify and see clearly the way that all people are made in God's image. And these are just two of the people um, who helped the church in the fourth century, um, and then all of us Christians since. They helped to clarify some of our core commitments in any time of transition, that whatever the world is doing and wherever it's going and whoever we are about to be, we're going to remain committed to asking some of these key questions. And so today we are finishing uh, with Macrina. Here's her picture. You'll notice the family resemblance with um, Basil and sibling of this really remarkable group, um, especially Basil um, and Gregory. They, they, even in their own lifetimes, 
um, were a known entity. They were called upon and they, they visited councils to provide clarity and uh, constructive direction to the theological conversations of the day. And since then, they've been established as some of the most significant players in this period of the history of the church. And uh, as all oldest siblings know, though, any younger sibling who happens to get lucky with any kind of genius or good insight owes just about all of it to their oldest siblings. <laughs> and Patrick knows that I'm also the oldest sibling, and I just needed to lay a little of that groundwork so we know what we're working with here. Um, Evan, I think that's all we need from the family tree. If someone wanted to take notes on it, they already have, and the rest of you are just ready for it to be done anyway. Um, in any case, uh, although it is kind of, I'm making a joke about being the oldest sibling and how the younger siblings give them credit, uh, that's not actually just a joke that I'm making. This is actually how we learn about Macrina. We learn about her because it actually is her younger brothers who take it upon themselves to ensure that anyone who hears them would know how much they owe to their sister. Um, it's really remarkable. Um, we don't have any writing attributed to her. There's a few different reasons for that. Um, but we get the gift of hearing what her brothers have to say, and it's quite a bit. Um, you heard Alyssa mention one of the treatises that Gregory of Nyssa, this established theologian, he, he writes, it's called On the Soul and the Resurrection. He's exploring what does it mean for, to be a Christian and to understand the soul and the resur these great mysteries. Um, he, he explores, it makes for really difficult reading, and it's, it has a lot to do with philosophy and science as they understood it in the 4th century, and it yields some really amazing conclusions, really hard to read, and it's part of his gift to the church even in his own day and he frames the whole thing as kind of a classic platonic dialogue with a teacher who is bringing him along and the teacher for him is none other than Macrina the one that he establishes as she's the one who's teaching me these things this great theologian who shaped the history of the church he wants them to know it's Macrina who has helped him in this way and he even refers to her as the teacher in, and refers to her in such a way that it, it's clear that he's expecting readers of the treatise to know who she is, um, which is remarkable. Um, but most of our information about Macrina directly comes from um, a different work. Alyssa mentioned it. It's called The Life of St. Macrina. And uh, Gregory uh, set it out after her death to give just an account of moments in her life um, information about her life and her story to help set out how his sister, his friend, his mentor, his teacher, how she was to be remembered, how he was remembering her, and how he would ask and invite uh, future generations, us, to remember her. So from a young age, Macrina is described as especially gifted. She's got a sharp intellect. She's got a, a really clear orientation toward God. It's, Gregory says that the Psalter was her constant companion as a child, and she was, from an early age, able to teach and preach from the scriptures, explaining them to the adults around her. While she was still very young, a marriage had been arranged for her, as was the custom for social advancement and security in that day for um, young women of her social position, but before they could be married, that young guy died. I don't know for what reason, um, but she, instead of receiving any of the suitors that sought after her in the years to come, and because of her confidence that that person to whom she was engaged um, was alive still in Christ, um, she said that this was going to be the point from which she directed her whole life toward faithfulness to the will of God in her life. And so from that time, as she sought and followed the will of God, she gathered a community of people around her, and they lived in a beautiful, monastic way, sharing their resources, sharing their lives, in a common effort to discern and follow the will of God. They cared for the sick and for, and, and for the poor in the time of famine, which, as you now know, your small experts in the 4th century roughly 369, famine in Cappadocia. You can just pull that one out when you need it. Um, but in that time, she and the people gathered in that community together went out onto the streets to gather children who were sick and poor, who had been exposed and left because their families couldn't afford to care for them. And she gathered them into a household of her own. And then as she con continued in her ministry, as, as she approached the end of her life, she grew sick 
and faint, and even as she was approaching death, Gregory describes how her mind and her love for God and for her family all remained sharp and clear. And it's actually in this deathbed scene that um, Gregory sets the later on the soul and resurrection conversation, that he, he has it set that he, as he's talking with his sister, as she is on the cusp of death, she is still enlightening him about the mysteries of the love of God and the promise of resurrection in Christian faith. And he describes in the life of St. Macrina her last moments as a prayer. And I love this. He says, it's one of those prayers where you didn't need to wonder if it reached all the way to God. You know some of those prayers that like maybe before a ball game or something, you're like, ah, I don't know if God tuned in for that one as well, you know? But, but, other, but other times, and Gregory says, this was not like one of those prayers where sometimes you get to witness and be a part of a moment where you know with full clarity that God is present. And Gregory says that's the kind of moment that she experienced at her, the very edge of death. And she offered one last prayer, and Gregory records that it's beautiful, um, and as she said, Gregory says that at the end, she closed her prayer and her life together. What a beautiful way to talk about the end of a holy, faithful woman who has led a life of goodness and generosity. After her death, they went searching for uh, kind of her savings and, and what she had stored up. She came from a wealthy family and they wanted to give her um, a dignified burial that signified her importance to them, and they were astonished to find that she had reserved nothing from the community. She had no treasures reserved. She had shared all she had with the community in their life together. That, and Gregory observes that her treasure truly had been in heaven and not stored up anywhere. She had not withheld from the community. Her life was full of remarkable moments, a unique faithfulness, a unique clarity about her purpose about, and about God's presence and activity and direction in her life and in the world. It's a gift for us to hear stories of folks like this. But to say that we're preaching this sermon today uh, because her, of her greatness or her great ideas or her sermons or the changes that she led in the church would be to misrepresent it a little bit. We don't have clear um, we, we don't have anything she wrote. We don't have a way of knowing exactly what changes she implemented or what she said. Um, and so in some ways, it's a little bit odd to approach this sermon about someone we know so little uh, we, for, directly. But just as we know about the events of her life, through her brother and her friends, the blessings of her life come to us through other people as well. Because although she may not have really definitive moments kind of, of major change and innovation in her life, uh, the life of St. Macrina isn't just concerned to report big, kind of noteworthy historical chapter highlights, but rather to fill in places and conversations and influence people who owe her their lives, that owe her um, as a teacher, as a friend, as a as someone who has brought them along. There are two brothers that we haven't mentioned at all. We don't know as much about them. Peter and Nacratius, uh, both of them. Really interesting. Nacratius was kind of a, a woodsman, and he hunted and provided food for an isolated community of elderly folks. And Peter gave away his food, and the desert became like a city because the number of people that visited him. And both of those brothers credit Macrina as the one directing them to that kind of generosity. You remember Basil, the one we, we did give a whole sermon to because we've got his sermons, and the one who helped the church to um, commit to caring for the poor. You may remember that part of his biography, his story, is that he, he got the very best teaching and he came home to continue in his cushy teaching job. But when he arrived home, Gregory says that Macrina noticed that he was puffed up with himself. And that Macrina was the one who helped him see clearly that this self, um, I, was, I lost the word I was looking for, but this self-aggrandizing, that's what I was looking for. This, this career path that could advance his standing was not the way that he ought to go, that instead he ought to give his life to the church to care for the sick and for the poor. Macrina is the one who directs his steps in that way, and that uh, offers Basil to recenter his life and to offer the gift of recentering to the church and 
from Basel, we receive an innovation and a clarification that comes to us and shapes our lives today. Do you remember Gregory? He got his whole sermon last week. He's a major theologian in the history of the church and more than almost any other single person has helped to shape the language that we use to talk about Jesus, who is God and human and, and Trinity, the one, the, the, the God who is three in one. Uh, and Gregory's the one who helped us to ask and identify, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Gregory's the first one who offers a, a recorded condemnation of the entire institution of slavery that we have in all of human history. The first one. But where did he get that? It was Macrina in the family years earlier who had first begun to persuade her parents as a child that they ought not to continue to have slaves in their household. As a young girl, it was Macrina who persuaded them to free their slaves, to invite them to live as part of their family and as equals. And that actually was the beginning point of her monastic community of people sharing their lives in devotion to God and loving their neighbor. Gregory wrote that sermon, but that influence, that direction comes from Macrina, and he makes no secret about that, and we ought not to miss that either. The weight and the beauty, the holiness of Macrina's life begins to grow as we tell the stories of the people who came after her. The gift of her life to the church, to all of human history, is seen more clearly as we tell more stories. And in fact, these are just the stories of the people whose names we know. After her death, it, it says that the many who had been rescued by her wept loudly because they had lost a mother and a friend, and a director. There are so many names of people whose lives she directed and saved and cared for, whose names we will never know, whose influence we will never see or understand, all of whose lives were made possible by her generosity. And so in this way, we, we've talked about the love of neighbor and the image of God with Basil and Gregor. We've talked about the faithfulness to the call of God. All of these structure Macrina's life and they are part of the gifts that she gives first to her family and then on through the centuries to us. Our sermon text today, we chose from James 1. Um, it's a way of I, trying to I just identify what is exactly Macrina's gift to the church. How would we put words to it? And it's maybe not specifically in, a, in one single moment of brilliance or ingenuity or innovation that's going to get her a whole chapter in the history book, but instead, perhaps we can think of Macrina, like James said, a doer of the word. Not someone who just gets a good idea and an insight once and has an idea about what it might look like for God to be alive and moving in the world. Not just someone who hears about that, but someone who does it, who by their life and by their actions enact the message, the good news of God in the world that is for all people. This is the religion that James says in our scriptures is pure and true and trustworthy, undefiled, that cares for orphans and widows. That's Macrina's life. That's the gift that she gives to us. Her life wasn't this results-based plan to map out a way to get into the textbooks of history but rather a way of living faithfully in the midst of her time. And we, as the church, we have always depended upon people like Macrina, often women, many who do not get the credit that we would maybe want to give them if we could but see the influence that they've had. And yet, Macrina and so many others have led and ministered and preached and lived faithfully without regard for the specific kind of result that could be guaranteed or earned, but rather as a commitment to faithfulness. And there's a beautiful way that it works together that I doubt that, that we could know about Basil and Gregory and the great gifts that they gave to the church in their time. I doubt that we could know those stories without the leadership and care of their older sister to raise them in that way. But similarly, I doubt that 
that we'd know about Macrina at all and the way that she raised them without the way that God worked through those big headline stories to bring clarity and recentering to the church through the history. It's a way that God is bringing all things together. And through this whole family, the story of the church and a clearer picture of our own calling can emerge. I love Gregory says this about Macrina. Never did she appeal for help, but God secretly blessed the little seeds of her good works until they grew into a mighty tree. It strikes me that this recenter series uh, cuts in a couple of different ways. There's a couple of hoped for um, kind of convictions that I guess emerge out of this. Part of what I hope for us as we tell these stories and we remember them, maybe we learn them for the first time, I hope that some of this is exciting and inspiring to read and hear from the sermons and uh, teachings of these folks from so long ago in such a different world that in some ways still speak so clearly that we get to live our lives in some kind of continuity and connection with these folks who otherwise would seem so far removed. That that's an exciting thing. I, I remember in, in the classroom 10, 10 years ago uh, when I heard for the first time that Gregory of Nyssa, a, a Christian, was one of the first in all of history, the first to write it down, to condemn the entire institution of slavery. We ought to know and be grateful that in our history, our, create, our creative, courageous words, that, that comes from our family, that comes from his Christian conviction, seeing the person of God and speaking bravely and clearly in his time, that is a gift and that ought to fill us with gratitude and excitement. In the midst of so many shortcomings and failures and great wickedness that has often come through and because of and as a part of the church, we also ought to know and we ought to be clear about those stories and we ought to see them and, and be honest as we are able and we also ought to tell the stories of where God has worked in beautiful and good and liberating and, uh, and empowering ways. It's, it's beautiful. We need to tell these stories to help us remember that there is indeed hope, that our life together through the Spirit does have generative resources for our world today, our shared faith. But there's another way this series cuts because telling these stories of people who have lived their lives to God with clarity and purity of intent, it is inspiring. But it calls us onward. It, it, it's a, it, there's a challenge. There's a conviction to read these sermons is difficult because, shoot, I, I'm afraid to preach some of those sermons that we've read because I don't live in that way entirely. There's a conviction that comes, and this is not to create a shame-based system where we take turns bludgeoning each other about how little we're doing compared to them or how little I'm doing compared to you or vice versa, but rather we tell these stories precisely for the purpose of being drawn onward, of being encouraged onward so that we grow ever more faithful, that we grow ever more into the image and likeness of God, that we grow deeper into our love and commitment to our neighbors. Our calling is not to become famous or to get our own chapter in the church history books. In some ways, in that way, Gregory and Basil are less of an example to us than Macrina. Because our calling is to be faithful, to follow the way of Jesus, to ask what it requires in our own time. This is the kind of commitment that serves to recenter the church. In the fourth century, but also the church in our own time. We are always on the journey of recentering, and Macrina is one of the saints that God has given to us to hold before us to see in the cloud of witnesses who would urge us onward in our faithfulness, not just by her words, but by her life well lived. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we are thankful to you for the stories of your people, the ones who help us believe that you are at work, that help us believe that we are giving our lives in a worthwhile and trustworthy direction. 
We ask that you would be with us to help us to uh, see ever more clearly the work of your spirit, that we might have the courage and the creativity to follow you here and now in our own time. We give you thanks and praise. In Christ's name, amen. We're now going to enter into a time of communion. Um, and so Nathan and someone, and Angie will be serving today. Um, and you will uh, line up, come through the center aisles. Um, and if you need gluten-free, it's the roll in the middle. And you will um, dip that yourself so that there's no cross-contamination. And then you'll go back to your seats. Um, and then we'll sing another song. So I'll have Josiah read the liturgy. This is a part of our worship. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Here we go. <laughs> this is a part of our worship where we culminate and unite together at Jesus' table. In communion, the loaf and the cup help us reflect on the history of our tradition and in the Last Supper. Communion is a practice where we get to come together face to face with a member of our community we are, and be reminded that we are in this together. And by receiving this from another Christ follower, we are reminded that we are recipients of Christ's grace. Jesus set this table with place for anyone who call themselves followers of Jesus. It is not a table for those who are deserving. As we know, Jesus was ridiculed for the inclusivity of his table. It is a table where we all can find life. On the same night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, leading to his crucifixion, he ate this meal with his followers we follow the same teaching and example he left with them and that the global church has followed since. As Jesus did, we give thanks and we break this bread as a representation of Jesus' body broken for us. We take and drink of the cup as a representation of the blood that poured from Jesus' body shed for us. When we eat and drink this together, we are coming together as the no matter what family that God made us through Jesus. And together, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his return to us. Come to the table. everybody to stand as we sing our last song um, and if you would like to explore becoming a member of Grandview um, or if you have anything you need prayer for um, Nathan's going to be in the back right over there um, to be available for you for what you need um, and now we're going to sing this last song
be seated for just a moment. Um, I've just got a few announcements, but I'm not going to tell you all because you heard me say them earlier. Um, College Edge Canopy uh, starts next week, and they're going to White Duck, so check that out if um, you are college age. Um, Love JC is on for September 23rd from 9 to 12. If you want to participate in that, you need to sign up between now and September 10th. And Two for Two is just around the corner, and so I hope that you will come and check out our intergenerational ministry and worship service. You can check out all of these things 
and more in our newsletter, in the church app, or over at the Life at Grandview table. And I would love to chat with you about any of that. Um, also, the giving boxes are on these tables, as well as other ways to give on the screen. Um, and if you would like to participate in that as an extension of whole life worship, um, that is available to you. Um, but also, please know that this is not an obligation or requirement, uh, but is just a way to participate in that way. Um, especially not an obligation or requirement if you're just checking things out. And I want to be sure I say that. Um, and now I will invite you to stand for the benediction. Go from here in the love of God, the grace we find in Christ Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.